Tokyo, Japan is on everybody's list of must visit cities in the world. It is consistently one of the most visited cities in Asia and for good reason. The city uniquely blends modern technology, urban landscapes, whilst still preserving their ancient traditions. The result is a city that is unlike anything you've ever seen before and has to be seen to be believed. As a matter of fact, if you've clicked on this video, there's a very good chance that you are planning a trip to the land of the rising sun. And if that is the case, well then this video was meant to find you as today I am going to be covering everything from what is the best time to go to Japan or what to pack, how to conquer their public transportation system like a boss and how to find the food places that the locals eat at all the way to social etiquettes and behaviors that you should be aware of before your first trip to Japan. Consider this your beginner's welcome pack to Tokyo, Japan. So let's get straight into it. Hey guys, it's just me here from the future. I'm just editing the video now and realizing that it is a bit longer than my average videos, but I do recommend for you to watch it all the way through, especially if you're traveling to Tokyo, Japan for the very first time to avoid making the same mistakes that I made during my recent trip. And hopefully this video is gonna save you many hours of research. Having said that, there are chapters in this video, so feel free to skip ahead to the chapters that are of more interest to you right now. You can always come back to the other chapters later. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Back to the show we go. Let's start with the best time to visit Tokyo and let's look at it from two perspectives. Starting with whether Japan does go through the four seasons, starting with spring from March to May, summer from June to August, autumn from September to November, and winter from December all the way to February. Each season has something special to offer. Spring is by far the most popular season because it is also cherry blossom season where you get to see beautiful hues of white and pink decorating the entire Tokyo city. It is also when the city gets a little bit warmer as the winter is slowly dissipating away. Summers is when their temperatures can go all the way up to the late 30s degrees Celsius but it is also beach season and when most of the festivals happen. We then have autumn which is the second most popular season because one the temperature and two it is when you get to see Tokyo bathe in that trademark foliage of orange and yellow hues. But Japan winter is nothing to scoff about as temperatures can dip to negative 25 degrees Celsius at the peak. But it is also prime time for getting into skiing and snowboarding as well as getting into the Christmas spirit. But let's also look at it from a flights and accommodation prices perspective. Unsurprisingly, winter which occurs from December to February is when Tokyo, Japan sees its lowest amount of travelers. Whilst there are still plenty of activities such as snowboarding and skiing, the lower temperatures tend to keep a lot of the travelers away. As a result, flight ticket prices and also accommodation prices tend to be its lowest during this period. So if you are looking to keep things budget friendly and also mostly crowd free, this is the best time to visit Tokyo. Which flows quite nicely into this next section where we talk about what you need to pack for your trip to Japan. Now, what should be in your bag is obviously dependent on when you're going, but there is one particular item that I think should be consistent across all four seasons. And that is a comfortable pair of walking shoes because believe you me, you are gonna be averaging 20 to 30,000 steps easy on a daily basis. Aside from that, what you need to pack is fairly straightforward for all other seasons apart from winter. If you're headed there during winter, there are a couple of things that I would recommend. Starting with the most obvious one, don't forget a solid waterproof jacket. My go-to is this Uniqlo one because it's quite thick but also it's still quite light, making it easy for you to wear and carry on the go. I also quite like this one from Kathmandu and the reason is because it goes all the way down to my knees which is superbly helpful when you're dealing with the super cold Tokyo winter. I would also recommend for you to bring only the one jacket and gauge the temperatures once you're there. You can always pop into Uniqlo to get another one. I'm also a huge fan of this Kathmandu pocket hand warmers. This is like completely unsported. I bought this myself uh, in my last winter trip. It heats up to about 55 degrees. Um, and to do that, you simply, you see this little disc in the, I don't know if you can see it, this little disc, you press on it. 
I don't know if it... There we go. And it will then do this. And that's it. It's like a warm little pack that you can hold between your hands. As I said, it heats up to 55 degrees. It lasts about half an hour to an hour. Um, and once you're done with it and you're back in your hotel, soak it in some hot water to get the gel clear again and you can reuse it. Pretty nifty, huh? You will quickly learn that your best friend will be your phone during your trip to Tokyo, Japan. So it is super important to make sure that your phone and never runs out of battery. Therefore, I do recommend you bring a power bank or two. I'm personally a fan of this 4-in-1 charger by Snap Wireless. It allows me to charge multiple devices at the same time and it also generally gives me two full charges on my phone when the power bank is fully charged. But if you're looking to use your phone while you're on the go when you're in Tokyo, Japan, I would also recommend a, one of these um, magnetic charges. I'm not sure what the technical term is, but it just claps onto, I think, the MagSafe portion of your, your phone and charges it so that you can still use your phone for maps and taking photos and videos and stuff while you're on the go. But one thing that really surprises a lot of people for a city like Tokyo, Japan is how many establishments still only take cash. This will hold especially true if you're venturing into the little streets with izakayas and smaller bars. So make sure you have some Japanese yen on hand. How much you should bring really depends on your itinerary. I'm from Australia and the exchange rates worked out better for me to do it in Australia before my departure, but definitely check the exchange rates and compare them before your trip. Do note as well, since we're talking about Tokyo, Japan, that many larger malls, hotels, and bigger restaurants will take credit cards. Aside from cash, the second most important thing you want to make sure you have before your trip to Tokyo, Japan is a reliable mobile data connection. You're going to need it for navigation, translation, and even your transportation needs. There are a few options with the most obvious one being that you could just turn on your international roaming, but do make sure that you check with your telco provider on what the international roaming plans are before you do so. You could also pick up a wireless Wi-Fi device that looks a little bit like this. They generally come with unlimited data. And one of the immediate benefits of this particular option is that it allows you to connect up to 10 devices at once, which is a great option if you're traveling with family or a few friends. If you are planning to pursue this wireless Wi-Fi dongle option, I can actually give you 10% off your wireless dongle rental if you rent it via Kluk. Simply use the code that I place in my description box when making your purchase. My personal go-to though as a frequent traveler is the eSIM option. For those who don't know, eSIM is basically an additional slot that most phones nowadays have that allows your phone to take on an additional network whilst still keeping your original SIM card in its slot. Most phones nowadays will come with an eSIM slot, but to find out for sure if your phone does, simply look for the eID, which is generally under settings and in the about section. One of the most immediate advantages of this option is that it allows you to keep your physical SIM in its place so that you can still get text and messages even when you're overseas. Just make sure you turn off data roaming on your original SIM. You can still use your phone as a hotspot for other devices as well. And if you've watched any of my other travel guides, you would already know that I'm about to recommend A Alo. I actually use this app on a regular basis because it allows me to buy eSIM plans for over 200 plus countries. And the good news is I can actually get you $3 off your first eSIM purchase via A Alo. Simply enter the code here and also placed in my description box when making your purchase and thank me later. But let's say your budget simply does not allow for you to purchase any mobile data plans. Well, you may be interested to know that there are plenty of free Wi-Fi spots throughout Japan. The thing with these Wi-Fi spots though is that each Wi-Fi spot will ask you to register to use the Wi-Fi and that can be quite tedious especially when you're on the go. This is where the Japan Wi-Fi Auto Connect app comes in. Simply fill in your details once within the app and the app will locate and connect you to any Wi-Fi spots that are within your proximity. Just know that your internet connection can still drop in and out depending on where you are and how close you are to a free Wi-Fi spot, but I still think it's a pretty cool feature given that it is free. 
The immigration lines to enter Japan can be quite long. It took me roughly about an hour to clear this particular queue. But if you're looking to speed up your immigration clearance a little bit, this next section is for you. Enter the Visit Japan website. I've placed the link here and also in my description box. Basically, the Visit Japan website is a website that allows you to pre-register your details versus having to fill in those little cards while you're on the flight so that the Japan immigration already has your details and you can as a result clear the counter a lot faster. Hot tip, the Visit Japan website will also ask you to scan your passport during the registration process. Make sure you're doing it in the daytime and also in a place that has good lighting. I tried to do it at night and even under good lighting, the cameras was just not able to pick up my passport. When you're done with your registration, you will get a QR code. Use that and your passport to clear Japan's immigration. Upon a landing at Narita or Hanada Airport, there are several options to take you from the airport into Tokyo or downtown Tokyo. Let me break down the options for you. First things first, catching a cab from the airport into Tokyo is a very expensive option, especially if you land at Narita because Narita is actually a lot further than Hanada. With the estimated cost being, depending on where your hotel is, from two to three hundred dollars when you're departing from Narita and even for Haneda it's gonna cost you about a hundred plus and you may be thinking hmm I may need to pursue this because I have a lot of luggage bags either because I don't travel light or I'm traveling with family but if you're looking to trim down your costs, did you know that both the Narita and Hanada airports offer luggage delivery services that will take your luggage back from the airport all the way to your hotel? You will find these services at the shipping counters which are located at the arrival halls of both airports. After claiming your luggage, simply head to a shipping counter, fill in some paperwork and hand in your luggage bag which will then be delivered directly to your hotel. This option will cost you roughly 30 to 40 dollars each way yes you can deliver your luggage back back the other way as well I have heard of some rare instances where the luggages took more than a day to arrive and whilst that is not a common occurrence I would still recommend for you to have a little bag with things that you would immediately need once you've checked into your hotel this is still a fantastic option though because a lot of the stations in Tokyo have a lot of stairs so imagine lugging your luggage through all of that speaking of trains now that you've sorted out your luggage by far the more popular options for you to head from the airport into the city are public transportation options which include buses and trains let's start with the options at Narita with Keisei Skyliner and Narita Express being the fastest options at 40 and 53 minutes respectively. The ticket prices for the Narita Express and KC Skyliner are actually pretty similar with the Narita Express being slightly more expensive. I actually got my Narita Express ticket at a discount because I purchased it directly at the JR East service center. But if you are going to pursue this option, just know that you will have to pay by cash because they do not accept any other forms of payment. The cheapest option to take you from Narita Airport into the city would be via local trains, which will cost around $9, but it will also take you longer. I think it takes about 90 minutes to get from the airport into the city. Also, if you're going to pursue this option, just know that if you're traveling during peak hours, the trains going into Tokyo, Shinjuku and Shibuya are going to be extremely crowded. There's also the airport limousine bus option which would cost you just under $10. For Hanada Airport, you've got the Kikyu Line and the Tokyo Monorail as options, both costing $5 to $6 respectively. Kikyu would get you into Shinagawa and Tokyo Monorail into Hamama Sutro, at which point you can connect into a JR Line to get you to the closest station to your hotel. Your time of arrival into Tokyo, Japan will also narrow down the options for you. So make sure to check for the operating hours of each option that you want to pursue prior to your trip. Okay, so you're all done checking in at your hotel and are ready to explore Tokyo. Let's talk travel passes. You may have already heard of the Japan Rail Pass aka the JR Pass whilst planning for this trip and are wondering if you need to get one. Long story short, if you mostly plan to stay within Tokyo, you most definitely do not need one. 
What you will need instead is a Suica or a Pasmo card. But what is a Suica or Pasmo card I hear you say? Both are rechargeable e-money cards that work on a pay-as-you-go basis. They can be used on all JR East lines within the Greater Tokyo area, private railway lines, subways, buses, and many more. And as they are e-money cards as well, you can also use them for small purchases at convenience stores, vending machines, and other locations that accept the Suica and Pasmo as a payment method. You can get a physical Suica at the JR East Service Center upon arrival. I got mine at the Narita Airport arrivals. You will be given the option to purchase a welcome Suica or a regular Suica. The difference is that you will need to put down a 500 yen deposit for your regular Suica, but it will last for 10 years from the time of its last use, which means you can use it on your return trips. Conversely, the welcome Suica is designed for people who do not plan to return to Japan. It does not require for you to put down a deposit, but you will lose any balance on the card after the 28 days has lapsed. Very similarly for the PASMO, you've got the PASMO passport and a regular PASMO. As I'm sure you can already guess, the PASMO passport does not require for you to put down a deposit, but it is only valid for 28 days. Any balance that's remaining on this PASMO passport after 28 days, you cannot get back. Conversely, a regular PASMO will require that 500 yen deposit, but is valid for 10 years from the time of its last use. Now, there's been a lot of talk about chip shortages causing a supply issue with the Suica and PASMO cards. In fact, when I was there, a regular PASMO was not available. But if that is indeed the case when you do travel, do know that you can activate a digital Suica or PASMO within your Apple wallet. Simply search for Suica or PASMO inside the Apple wallet and top it up using Apple Pay. The Tokyo subway system comprises of 13 lines and 285 stations, which can be quite overwhelming, especially when you're at larger stations like Shinjuku, Shibuya, and Tokyo. But that's what this next section is for. I am gonna give you some tips and tricks to help you navigate through the subway system like an expert. So each of the lines within the subway system is nominated by an alphabet. For example, the Ginza system is noted with the alphabet G. Each station along the line is then assigned a number and as a result you can easily identify a station using the combination of the alphabet and the number. This alphabet and number combination is particularly genius and helpful for people who don't speak the Japanese language like myself and maybe you when asking or giving directions. And you will also typically find these signs at every platform and should use them to determine if you're on the correct platform that's going in the correct direction. To illustrate this let's use this example that says that we are on the line from M07 to M25. Let's say that I am on M07 now and I headed to M15, which is the Kasumi Gaseki station. As M15 is between M07 and M25, that means that I am on the correct platform. Further, if you plan on staying in Tokyo, Google Maps is going to be your best friend. Allow me to show you how to use it to navigate through the Tokyo subway system. Let's use this example route here. As you can see, Google Maps also utilizes the alphabet number combination that we spoke about earlier. But what I'm about to say next is particularly important if you're at some of the larger stations such as Tokyo Station. Use this to locate the right entry point because if you enter via the wrong entry point, you could be looking for your platform for a long time. Once you've entered via the right entry point, use signs such as the color and name of the line that you need to be on, the direction that it's heading towards, and also the platform number to help you identify the platform you need to be on. But if you're a foodie, you're gonna wanna pay attention to this next one. There are literally so many restaurants to choose from in Japan. And honestly, you could eat at a different restaurant in Tokyo every single night during your trip and lunch at a different restaurant every single day. And you would still have barely scratched the surface of the restaurants that are on offer. And the standard of food is so high in Japan that you could also even survive by just eating at 7-Eleven or Family Mart. But if you are interested to eat at the restaurants that the locals actually rate, you need to pay attention to this part. You need to download Tablog, link here and also in my description box. It also comes in an app form, but on the website, you can actually toggle to change the language to English. It is a website that comprehensively lists all the restaurants within a certain area in Japan. As you can see here, you can search by food type, 
which area of Japan, if you're dining alone or with a group of people, etc. And it will show you the top restaurant spots in Japan as rated by the locals. And for the record, Japanese people have very high standards when it comes to food. So anything that is three stars and above is gonna be very good. I honestly used Tabalog a lot during my last trip because I was traveling alone and could only eat so much. So I wanted to make sure that whatever I was eating was the best there was to offer. So if you didn't already know about this, you are welcome. The need for this next section is exactly why we can't have nice things. As you might have already heard, Japan has already banned tourists from the Gisha district in Kyoto, which is incredibly sad because we as visitors to the country now miss out on experiencing a whole part of their culture. All because a few tourists do not know how to behave or respect the country that they're in. So I also want to briefly talk about some social etiquettes. First off, definitely learn some rudimentary Japanese, such as thank you, which is arigato gozaimasu, hello, which is konnichiwa, and sayonara for a goodbye. And honestly, knowing a little bit of rudimentary Japanese, being polite and bowing to people who have more seniority than you goes a long way in Japan. Secondly, train etiquette. Definitely do not eat, take phone calls, or talk loudly when you're on Japan trains. It is considered disrespectful. Speaking of eating, openly eating while walking around Tokyo is also frowned upon, so definitely do not do that. Much like the trains in Tokyo, punctuality is something that is highly regarded. So if you are making plans with a local, do aim to be on time. It is truly my aim to make this guide helpful and give you confidence that you'll be able to navigate yourself to and in Tokyo effectively. If it indeed has, don't forget to like and subscribe to see more content like this. If you do have any further questions, do feel free to drop a comment in the comment box below. I do love hearing from you. And if you plan to do some detours to other cities such as Kyoto and Osaka, you may need a JR Pass. Check out my video at the end of this video, which will break down the elements you need to consider when deciding if you need a JR Pass, which is particularly important because JR Pass prices increased by over 70% since last year. And if you got to this point of the video, I just want to thank you so much. It really does mean everything. I do hope that you have a fantastic day ahead or that you've already had a good day. As always, I will see you very soon in the next video. Ciao! And Tokyo Monorail into Hamama Shuchu. Tokyo Monorail into Hamama Chu. Hamama Shuchu. And Tokyo Monorail into Hama. And Tokyo Monorail into Hamama Shuchu. 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 And Tokyo Monorail will take you into Hamama Shuchu.